Hello and welcome! In the coming moments, you are about to hear a message that will unpack the truth from the Word of God and move you towards God's purpose for your life. Good evening, family, and greetings in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am excited tonight to welcome you to this live broadcast as we commemorate Pascal Friday. I wanna welcome you to this auspicious night. Every one of you who are joining us on our Facebook and on our YouTube platforms, this is Pastor Clement, and I am so excited that we are able to come together around the Word of God on this very important day. Now, I want you to grab your Bibles and your notebooks because we are going to be looking into the Word of the Lord tonight as I encourage you and as I stir you up by the Spirit of God so that the faith of God that is in you is so stirred up that you will receive your breakthrough tonight. Because tonight is a very special night. It's a very, very, you know, important night in the Christian faith. And I want you to be a partaker of what this night represents. Now, this night is known as Good Friday, you know, in the Christian circles. And tonight for my message, I believe that I'm going to be sharing a word with you that will show you and reveal to you the goodness in this evening. All right. Even though this uh, Good Friday probably is known as a bloody night, a treacherous night, a night of betrayal, But I want you to see that whatever the enemy meant for evil, God always turns it around for good. And I want you to see the goodness of the Lord in what transpired on this particular night when Jesus Christ was crucified on behalf of the entire humanity. All right, before we get into the word of the Lord, I want us to bow our hearts in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity that you have afforded us tonight to gather together around your word. I pray, O God, that the entrance of your word will bring light and give understanding to the simple, that the anointing of your spirit will flow, God, even as your word goes forward, to minister to every need that is represented, O God, even in the lives of your people, that the anointing will destroy the yoke and that the burdens will be lifted off of the lives of your people and that your people will experience a breakthrough tonight. Those who have come tonight trusting you with one need or the other, I thank you, O God, that you will meet them at the point of their need because you are the God that supplies all our needs according to your riches and glory. We give you praise and we thank you, O God. And God's people said, amen and amen. All right, are you excited? You know, this is Good Friday. Easter Friday, but I prefer to call it Pascal Friday. Now, the word Pascal is derived from the Greek word Pascha and the Hebrew word Pesa. Now, those words speaks or means Passover, Passover. And that would also means to jump. Now, you remember the trend of Israel when they were in the land of bondage in Egypt? And how that on that night, when the angel of death went across the land of Egypt, killing the firstborn of the Egyptians, remember that the children of Israel were spared. And the reason why they were spared was because of the blood that was on their doorposts and on the lintels of their windows. And that tells you that the Passover did not come cheap. Bible says that you are bought with a price. Yes, there's a price to the Passover. And that prize is what we are commemorating tonight. That prize is what we are celebrating tonight. And Jesus Christ is the reason for the season. He is the reason why we are celebrating tonight because of his endless love for us, because of his sacrifice for all of humanity. That's the reason why we're gathered tonight. So when the children of Israel put that blood on the doorpost of their homes and the lintels of their window, The Bible says that the angel of death passed over. In other words, there was a jump that took place. And the reason why the angel of death jumped their homes 
was because of the blood. And I tell you tonight that that blood is upon your life if you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and your personal Savior. That blood is over your life. And you are going to experience a Passover. There's going to be a jump that's about to take place in your life. Somebody's about to take a leap. You're about to take a leap from not enough or just enough to more than enough. Somebody's about to take a leap from a place of sickness to the place of soundness in your health. Somebody's about to take a leap from the place of lack to the place of abundance. Somebody's about to take a leap tonight from the place of oppression to the place of deliverance. God is about to meet you at the point of your need. Now that word Pascal, like I said, you know, is derived from the Hebrew word Passover. So somebody's about to experience freedom. You are about to experience freedom from darkness, freedom from oppression, freedom from depression, freedom from addiction. I don't know what you're trusting God for tonight, but I want to join my faith with yours. As the word of the Lord goes for tonight, I want you to trust God that he will begin this good work in you. His ultimate plan is to bring it to a completion. So you are under construction now, child of God. So do not be weary and do not give up. Whatever it is that you are going through tonight, I want you to know that the answer is on the way. God is about to meet you at the point of your need in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And God's people said, amen. Now, our text tonight narrates what had transpired before Jesus was handed over by Pilate to be crucified. So if you have your Bibles, Please, I want you to turn with me to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 27. Matthew, chapter 27. Now, I'm going to read the first two verses, and then we're going to jump to verse number 11 of this particular text. If you found Matthew, chapter 27, I want to read from verse number 1. Now, it reads, when it was morning, Obviously, Jesus had been arrested the previous day, and in the evening when he was arrested, I believe that he was taken into custody. So the Bible says when it was morning, all the chief priests and the elders of the people held a consultation against Jesus. I want you to know this. They held a consultation against Jesus, against the very one whom God sent to come and pay the ultimate price for their sins, against the one whom God sent to come and set the captives free, to come and relieve and release man from his captivity. That was the very one they went against. Isn't it interesting oftentimes that people are blinded from their own deliverer? And you kind of find that all through scriptures that when God sends a prophet to the people, they kill the prophet. When God sends a deliverer to the people, they resist the deliverer. And Jesus was not any different. And I want you to know the people who are resisting him. I want you to know the people who are going against him. The Bible says the chief priests and the elders of the people, they held a consultation. And the meeting that they had, the gathering of this religious elites was to put Jesus to death. That was the plan that they were coming together, you know, as a result of this consultation to hatch. And this religious elite, you must understand, have become adversaries of Jesus, like we see in this verse. And the reason was because of jealousy and envy. In fact, in the gospel, there was a time when the Pharisees said that the whole world followeth him. So for them, it was all about competition. It was all about numbers. It wasn't about the souls. But for Jesus, it was about the souls because the Son of Man came to seek and to save them that are lost. See, they were not after the souls. They were after the popularity. They were after the fame. They were after the notoriety. But Jesus was after the souls of men. And the Bible declares that they came against him just for the purpose of silencing him. They wanted to put him to death. And It just boggles my mind, you know, sometimes, you know, to think how that the adversary can galvanize and influence people that you would least expect, 
to carry out his devious plans. Now, you remember in the gospel when Jesus said to Peter, he said, Simon, Simon, he said, Satan has desired to have you, that he may sift you like a wheat. I want you to understand that, you know, the devil always attempts everyone. No one is off limits for Satan. And so even the chief priests and the elders of the people are not off limits to be used as tools in the hands of the adversary. And they did not even understand that they were being used as tools in the hands of the adversary to carry out his devious plans. And so here they came together and were being used by the devil and they didn't even know. And when Jesus said this to Peter, you know, he said, Satan has desired to sift you like a wheat, but he said, I have prayed for you that your faith fail you not. Now, I want you to understand that even in your journey of life, even as you walk with the Lord, there are times when people whom you do not expect that the enemy can use, you know, to plot against you and to bring about a destruction in your life or to try and deter your progress. See, there are times when the enemy will use such people, but I want you to understand something, that regardless of who the enemy can use as a tool to try to disrupt your life or to disrupt the progress that you're making, remember the word of God declares that all things work together for good. All things, not some things, all things work together for good. I want you to note that text. When it says all things, it means that God is the one that's in charge. Whatever it is that you're going through right now, it doesn't matter because the scripture says all things. Whatever it is that you're going through right now that might probably might seem like it's working against you, I want you to know that God is in charge. God is the puppet master and he is the one pulling the strings behind the curtain. So whatever you're going through right now, don't think that the enemy is in charge. No, God is in charge. He's the one that has allowed. He's the one that has permitted whatever it is that you're going through, even in this season of Pascal. He is one that has allowed whatever it is that you're facing, whatever it is that you're going through in your life, in your marriage, in your finances, on the job, with the children, even in your business. God is the one that has allowed it. And God did not allow it because he's interested in punishing you, but rather in polishing you. God wants to polish you. I don't know who I'm speaking to. He wants to refine you. So if you are going through the fire right now, I want you to know that that fire is not going to burn you. But rather that fire is refining you. He's trying to make the best out of you. He's trying to bring out the best out of you. So I want you to know that all things are working together for you. So the first thing is all things are working together for you. God is in charge. And secondly, whatever you're going through is not working against you because he says they are working for you. It's not working against you. It's working for you. Isn't that something to rejoice about? Isn't that something to calm your nerves down? You know, isn't that a news to just give you some sense of comfort, you know, and sense of security to know that God's got your back? It says all things are working together for good, for good, not even for evil, for good to them that love God and to them who are the called according to his purpose. So child of God, don't despair in whatever situation you find yourself because it is all working out together for your good. Now look at verse number two of Matthew chapter number 27. Then he goes on here and says, and they bound him and led him away. See, what I'm trying to do tonight is I want to go line upon line, you know, you know, precept upon precept and verse upon verse. So I want you to follow me closely. And Bible says, and they bound him and led him away and handed him over to Pilate the governor. Now, this religious elites are now in cahoots or in partnership with the political elites against their own very own. Jesus was supposed to be contemporaries with these religious leaders, but obviously had become an adversary to them, like I said earlier on, because of envy and jealousy. And they wanted to carry out their hideous plan, you know, under the radar. And they wanted to do it by using Pilate, you know, in order to accomplish this evil plot without, you know, drawing any attention to themselves. And oftentimes this is what the enemy does. The people that he uses, against you. Oftentimes they present themselves as friends. You know, the Bible says that, 
your enemies are in your own very house. Remember when Jesus came to betray his master? He betrayed him with a kiss, not with a punch on the face. He betrayed him with a kiss. When he came to kiss his master, it was so as to not draw attention to himself. But I want you to understand that whatever it is that is coming against you right now, the word of God declares that if God be for us, who can be against you? Child of God, even on this Pascal Friday, I want you to understand that God sent his own son, Jesus Christ, to work on your behalf. Nothing that you're going through right now is working against you, but rather everything is working for you. Look with me again as we, you know, jump to verse 11 of Matthew chapter 27. The Bible said, now Jesus stood before the governor, Pilate, and the governor asked him, are you king of the Jews? Now, the chief priest that brought Jesus Christ before Pilate who was the governor. And when they brought him before Pilate, it was for the purpose of Pilate doing their dirty work. And Pilate asked him the question. He says, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said to him, you have stated the fact. Now, what fact was Jesus referring to? Now, according to the account of his birth, it was no secret that Jesus was born king of the Jews. Now, we all know that after he was born in Bethlehem of Judea, the Bible tells us that wise men in the east saw a star. And when they saw this star, it was a very unique star. And they followed this star for almost two years to the palace of Herod, the king. And when they got to the palace of Herod, the king, they made this announcement that we saw a star in the east and we followed that star. And that star was a star of a king that was born. And they asked this question. They said, where is the king of the Jews? Where is the king of the Jews? They knew that that star was the star of the king of the Jews. That star announced itself the moment Jesus was born. Do you know every one of you watching me tonight that the moment you were born, your star was announced? Your star was announced and your greatness, you know, was perceived even by people that did not know you. See, that is why for some of you, you don't understand why the enemy has been in battle against you, why you have been going through hell and going through high water. It's because your star, the moment you are born, your star announced your arrival. Hallelujah. And that arrival was arrival of greatness. Some greatness has been born somewhere in the world. So every one of you sitting and listening to me tonight, I want you to understand that your greatness was announced the moment you were born, just like Jesus. And when it was announced to Herod, I want you to know that it was not haphazard, that those wise men ended up at Herod's palace to announce to him that the true king has been born. The one that will bring deliverance has been born. I don't know what you're going through tonight, but I want to declare to you that this Pascal Friday is an announcement all over again to every one of you who have given your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. And even to those of you who are yet to do so tonight, that the Savior has been born. The King has been born. The Deliverer has been born. The one that will deliver us from our sin, that will deliver us from bondage, that will deliver us from all of the things that militates against our life. He has been born. So you have no reason to fear anymore. You have no reason to even fear death because the one who has conquered death has been born. And so tonight, I want you to open your heart to receive what he has come to offer because he wasn't just born just for the purpose of being born, but he was born in order to accomplish his certain task in our life. The Bible says how God anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth and he went about doing good, healing all those who were oppressed of the devil because God was with him. See, let me tell you, even as you're watching from your home tonight, the power and the spirit of God is going to permeate that environment. God is going to reach out to you and he's going to meet you at the point of your need. Even on this Easter you know, evening, on this Pascal evening, God is going to reach out and meet you according to the needs that you have in your life. Now, one of the accusations 
that was leveled against Jesus was that he claimed to be the king of the Jews. Hence, Pilate was asking the question, are you the king of the Jews? Are you listening to me tonight? Pilate was asking him that question, are you the king of the Jews? And the reason why they leveled the accusation against Jesus that he claimed to be the king of the Jews was because they wanted to present him as a threat to the Roman government. They wanted to set him up against the government of Caesar so that he, he might look like a rebel, somebody that is fighting against the government. Now look at this in verse number 12 of Matthew 27. But when the charges were made against him by the chief priests and elders, now I want you to know the people who were bringing charges against Jesus. It wasn't people outside of their faith. It was people within the faith. Remember I said to you earlier on that your enemies, according to the words of Jesus, are from within your own house. So Jesus' enemy were from within the house of God. These were chief priests and these were elders of the people. And the Bible says when the charges were made against him by the chief priests and elders, notice Jesus made no answer. There was no response. He did not respond to these charges. Why? Because these charges were false accusations. They were lies that were brought against him. In Isaiah chapter 53, verse number 7, you know, the prophet Isaiah, you know, called these charges oppression. He referred to these charges as affliction. They wanted to afflict Jesus. They wanted to oppress Jesus with some of these Trump charges that they brought up against him. Look at Isaiah chapter 53, verse number 7. It reads, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. So when they brought these charges against Jesus, they were bringing these charges against him in order to oppress him, in order to oppress his ability to defend himself. They wanted to afflict his mind. I mean, they wanted to defame his character. They wanted to destroy his reputation. They wanted to ultimately put him to death because they wanted him to seem as someone who is coming against the government of the day. The Bible says he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before its shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. I want you to note how many times it says Jesus was in silence, almost three times. The Bible says he opened not his mouth and he went before his sharers silent. And finally, in the conclusion of that verse, the Bible says he opened not his mouth. Now, why? Because Jesus knew that it was all a plot. This was all a plot that was based on lies and false accusations and allegations. And I want you to see how far this supposedly godly men are willing to go. In Matthew chapter 26, a preceding verse to our main text, Matthew 26 in verse number 59, the Bible says the chief priests and the whole council tried to find some false evidence against Jesus to put him to death. Now, it is interesting to note that even when God is with you, it doesn't mean that people can come against you. But like the scripture says, if God be for you, they cannot be against you. I want you to note how that there was just the whole council of people who are supposed to be godly people who had come together to find some false evidence against Jesus in order to put him to death. I don't know who is watching me tonight. And maybe you have been through some trials in your life. You've been through some challenges in your life where people were trying to pull you down, trying to bring you down, and they came up with false accusations. See, this is always the tactic of the enemy. This is always the modus operandi of the enemy. When he wants to destroy people, he tries to come up with all kinds of false evidences and accusations against you in order to destroy your life. And that is what they tried to do to Jesus here. Look at verse number 60. The Bible says, but they could not find any, even though many people came forward and told lies about him. See how the enemy operates. He's the father of lies. And now he got people, you know, as 
the chief priests and the elders of the people have been influenced by the enemy, by Satan himself, to gather people who are going to bring up false evidences against Jesus. And they told lies about him. Finally, the Bible says two men stepped up and in verse 61, they said, this man said, I am able to tear down God's temple and three days later, build it back up. You know, I thought about this for a moment, you know, because the gospel tells us that every time Jesus taught the people, he taught them in parables. And there was nothing that he said to the people that he did not say in parables. I would suppose that if, you know, Jesus says something like what they accuse him of, you know, that they would have given him an opportunity to explain what he meant because he could be speaking in parables as opposed to speaking to them literally. But you know what? They didn't care about what he said. They didn't care what he meant, even when he said what he said. What they cared about was to find a way to destroy him. And the Bible says that when they brought this accusation against him, I want you to look at this. Go back to Matthew chapter 27. Even as he stood before Pilate, Pilate then said to him in verse 13 of Matthew chapter 27, he said, do you not hear how many and how serious are the things they are testifying against you? Verse 14, but he made no reply to him not even to a single accusation. Jesus did not respond to those accusations. And the reason is because he knew that these were all lies that were being told about him or against him. And the Bible says, such that the governor marveled greatly. Verse 15, now at the feast of the Passover, the governor was in the habit of setting free for the people, any one prisoner whom they chose. Now, this was in the governor's habit per se, but rather it is one that is predicated on the ordinance of the atonement, which took place during the Jewish festival known as Yom Kippur. And this is found in the book of Leviticus. And this ordinance, you know, of releasing a prisoner, all right, during the festival of Yom Kippur, you know, is one that is about to explain what's going to happen next you know, in this chapter that we are reading in Matthew 27, look at Leviticus chapter 16. And I want us to look at, you know, this ordinance of letting go one prisoner, all right, and putting the other one to death. I want us to look at that ordinance as it has been explained here in Leviticus chapter number 16. Look at me at verse number six. The Bible says, Aaron shall offer the bull as a sin offering which is for himself and make atonement for himself and for his house. Verse number seven, he shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the meeting. I want you to note what he's going to take, two goats. Verse number eight, then Aaron shall bring the goat on which the Lord's lot fell and offer it as a sin offering. So there are two goats that Aaron was going to present before the Lord at the tabernacle of meeting, and they're going to cast lots, you know, for these two goats. And the one on which the lot falls on, you know, the Bible says that that one is the one that will be sacrificed. And the one that the lot does not, cast, that does not, the, the, the lot that they cast does not fall on, is the one that will be released as a scapegoat. So watch this. So then Aaron shall cast lot for the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for the scapegoat. Verse number, verse number nine, and Aaron shall bring the goat on which the Lord's lot fell and offer it as a sin offering. Did you see that? Verse number 10, but the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement upon it and to let it go as a scapegoat into the wilderness. So there are two goats. Now the Lord's lot falls on one goat and that goat is used as a sin offering. Then there is a second goat on which the Lord falls on as a scapegoat and that lot and that goat particularly is led to go free and to wander in the wilderness. Now look at verse number 22 of that chapter 16. 
Look at this. It says, the goat shall bear on itself all their iniquities to, un and to an uninhabited land, and it shall release the goat in the wilderness. So this goat that is called the scapegoat is going to bear the sins of the entire nation. Hear this now. And that goat is going to be released into, note the word, uninhabited land. So if it is an uninhabited land, it means that that goat is not going to come in contact with a human. If it's uninhabited, then that means that there's no human on that particular you know, jurisdiction or geographical location. So that goat come in contact with humans. Now, what is the significance of this? In Psalms 103, verse number 12, the Bible says, as far as the east is from the west, so far has the Lord removed our transgressions from us. Did you see that? That is the significance of the scapegoat. So the one goat dies as a sin offering for the people, and the other goat, which is referred to as a scapegoat, is released carrying the sins of the people because you know back in the Old Testament, the sins were not taken you know, you know, away. The sins were covered, and it was covered for a year. So that goat goes away into the wilderness, never to come in contact with a human being, signifying how far God removed our sins away from us so that it will no longer be remembered. Now, I want us to go back to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 27. I want us to tie all of this together because I want to submit to you that the two goats that we just saw in Leviticus chapter number 16 are but one single goat. Now, there are two goats, but they are one single goat. Now, you say, Pastor, how did you reach that conclusion? Now, if you are back with me to Matthew chapter 27, I want you to look with me at verse number 16. Look with me at verse number 16. The Bible says, at that time, there was a well-known prisoner named Jesus Barabbas. Look at this. At that time, there was a well-known prisoner. Because remember, the previous verse we read in verse 15, Bible says it was a habit of the governor to release one prisoner on the Passover feast or, you know, the festival known as Yom Kippur. Now, at that time in verse 16, the Bible says there was a well-known prisoner named Jesus Barabbas. Verse 17, so when the crowd gathered, the Bible says Pilate asked them, which one do you want me to set free for you? Now, I'm beginning to set the stage for what we just read in Leviticus chapter number 16, where the Bible says that Aaron, who is the high priest, is going to present two goats before the tabernacle of the meeting and will cast lots. In other words, a choice is going to be made here as to which goat is going to be the sin offering and which goat is going to be the scapegoat. And that is a scenario that is playing out here in this particular chapter. So we find a type of one goat called Jesus Barabbas. And then there's another one called Jesus the Messiah. Look at this, verse 17. I want to read this to you again. So when the crowd gathered, Pilate asked them, which one do you want me to set free for you? Jesus Barabbas or Jesus called the Messiah? Did you notice that both men are called by the first name Jesus? Did you see that? That is why I said to you earlier on that the two goats you find in Leviticus chapter number 16 are but one goat. They are but one goat is the same person. Notice that their names, their first names are the same, all right? But I want you to note that one is called Jesus Barabbas. Now I want us to look at the word Barabbas. Now the word Barabbas, uh, you know, it's made, you know, that word Barabbas is made up of two words. It's the word Bar and the word Abbas. 
The word Ba simply means son. And the word Abba, you know, is the word that means father. So there's one called Jesus, son of the father. Did you see that? Jesus, son of the father. So Barabbas means son of the father. So one is called Jesus Barabbas or Jesus called the Messiah. Are you seeing this? So now we are going to have to cast lots like we find in Leviticus chapter number 16. In verse 18, the Bible says, Pilate knew very well that the Jewish authorities had handed Jesus over to him because they were jealous of him. I mean, isn't that amazing? I mean, it's interesting to note here that, you know, Pilate himself knew that this religious elite had an ulterior motive. You see, they perceived Jesus as a threat. And Pilate knew this, that that was the reason why they handed him over so that he can do what they did not want to do. They didn't want to draw attention to themselves that they were behind the plot to destroy Jesus. So they were going to use the political authority to carry out their heinous crime. Are you seeing this? But Pilate understood, and, and that's a shame to think about it for a moment, that you know people who are in the circular arena of life knows that religious people are fighting against and amongst themselves, and that they are using the political connections that they have you know, to carry out their personal vendetta against their own. Are you listening to me? So the Bible said he knew very well that the Jewish authorities had handed Jesus over to him because they were jealous. Look at this, verse 19. Why Pilate was sitting in the judgment hall, I believe contemplating what was he gonna do. His wife sent him a message. Have nothing to do with that innocent man, she said, because in a dream last night, I suffered much on account of him. Isn't it interesting that the wife of Pilate was more spiritually perceptive than people who were supposed to be far more perceptive than her? And yet these were the very people who were now tools in the hand of the adversary to inflict pain and death upon the very one that God sent to save them. What an irony. Look at this, verse number 20. Then the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask Pilate to set Barabbas free. I want you to note the ones who were influencing this lot that was about to be cast in this particular instance. It was the chief priests and the elders who are influencing the people to do wrong, to make the wrong decision. And what they fail to understand is that every man is going to be held accountable for the decisions that we make in this lifetime. So here they were influencing the people to do the wrong thing. And they told the people, ask Pilate to set Barabbas free and have Jesus put to death. You know, what is so awesome when I look at this verse is the fact that when we go back and look at what we read in Levit Leviticus chapter number 16, these chief priests and elders of the people are fulfilling scriptures without knowing it. Do you know that there are times when people can be used as a tool, you know, to fulfill the word of God? You know, just like so many, you know, characters you find in the word of God who are being used to fulfill prophecy. They were being used to fulfill the word of God. You know, and so the chief priests and the elders were busy fulfilling the prophecy and fulfilling the ordinance, fu fulfilling the shadow and the type that we find in the word of God without even realizing that they were being used to carry out the fulfillment of scripture. I want you to note that they persuaded the crowd to ask Pilate to set Barabbas free. And that is the title of our discourse, Set Barabbas Free. And why, you know, is it important that Barabbas be set free? Because when we go back to the type and the shadow, I want you to note that Barabbas here in this text is a type of the scapegoat. He's a type of the scapegoat. And what's a scapegoat? A scapegoat is the one 
that is held accountable for the sins of other people. Now, Barabbas, the Bible tells us, was a notorious prisoner. He was a thief. He was a notorious man. He deserved to die. You see, just like you and I, we were the sinners. Bible says, while we were yet sinners, God commended his love toward us. We were the one that was supposed to die. But notice something here. Barabbas was the one that was being asked to be released. He was a scapegoat. So this says, tell Pilate to set Barabbas free and have Jesus put to death. So Jesus was that sin offering, that goat that the Lord's lot fell on that became the sin offering that was sacrificed for the sin of the people. Are you seeing what's going on here? So Jesus was that goat that was sacrificed as a sin offering and Barabbas was a scapegoat that was let to go free. So when Barabbas was led to go free, it was you and I being led to go free. And the only reason we could be led to go free is because we are in Christ. Because notice that he was called Jesus Barabbas. If any man be in Christ Jesus is a new creation. So when you come into Christ, when you accept him as your Lord and your Savior, then you can be set free from everything that you deserve to die for. The things that were supposed to come upon you as God's judgment for your sin, you escape it, you jump it. See, that's what Passover is all about. The death that you deserved that was supposed to come upon you, the punishment that you deserve that was supposed to come upon you, it passes over. Why? Because you accepted the blood. Just like the Israelites, when they accepted the blood and they took that lamb and killed it and took the blood and put it on their doorposts and on the lintel of their windows, saying that we accept the blood. We are in partnership with the blood. So the moment you come into partnership with God, see everything that was supposed to come upon you as judgment that is due to you, it passes over you, it jumps over you. So the reason the children of Israel experienced Passover wasn't because they were more righteous, it was because of what they accepted on that night when the death angel went across the land of Egypt. And that is what this night is all about. It's about you accepting the sacrifice that God made available to all humanity in his son, Jesus Christ, the one who became the sin offering in this particular text that we're looking at. Look with me at verse number 21. But Pilate asked the crowd, which one of these two do you want me to set free for you? Barabbas, they answered. They all shouted. Barabbas, son of the father. Do you know that we are the sons of the father? So the Messiah, Jesus the Messiah, came to set free Jesus, the sons of the father. Are you seeing this? That is what happened in this text. Verse number 22. What then shall I do, Pilate asked, with Jesus called the Messiah? Pilate asked them, then they said, crucify him. They all answered. They said, crucify him. In other words, let him be the sin offering and let Barabbas go free. But Pilate asked, what crime has he committed? Then they started shouting at the top of their voices, crucify him. See, imagine people advocating the death of a man without a cause. See, that's why the Bible was so clear to say to us that he who knew no sin became a sin for us. So the truth of the matter is that he had no sin. There was no crime that he committed for which he was supposed to be put to death. But all of the people, and I want you to see that this is just scriptures being fulfilled here in this particular account that we're reading. All of the people together in one voice, they shouted and they said, crucify him, put him to death. And whilst they were doing this, they did not realize that they were fulfilling scripture on that particular night. They were fulfilling scripture. 
even as you're listening to me right now, scriptures are being fulfilled in our ears. And they said, crucify him. And when Pilate saw that it was no use, verse number 24, to go on, but that a riot might break out, he took some water and washed his hands in the front of the crowd and said, I am not responsible for the death of this man. This is your doing. Verse 25, and the whole crowd answered, says, let the responsibility of his death fall on us and on our children. I mean, think about this. They said, let the responsibility fall on us and on our children. You see, when people are being driven by hatred, you know, sometimes they even own up to curses. You know, they have a, a, a careless attitude. You know, they, they don't even reason when they say things. I mean, there was no reasoning here. I mean, think about them saying, let the responsibility for his death fall on us and even on our children. So they were placing a curse upon themselves. Why? Because they were so driven by hate. See, child of God, don't be driven by hate. Because when you are driven by hate, you surrender yourself to things that might be destructive to your life without even realizing it. And that was what the crowd was doing here. They were not even realizing that they were placing a curse upon their own lives. On this Paschal Friday, I want you to know that he was the one that was made a curse for us. You are no longer a curse. Don't make yourself the curse. Don't bring a curse upon yourself. But rather, accept the blessing that Jesus, the Messiah, came to bring upon Jesus, the sons of God. And that is what this season is all about. Accept that blessing, not the curses, because he came to bestow upon us blessings. Even in this season, he came to shower you with his blessings. He came to shower you with his glory so that you can be the best that God wants you to be. Look at verse 26. Then Pilate set Barabbas free for them. Remember what we read in Leviticus chapter number 16. The scapegoat is set free to go into an uninhabited land. And there it wanders so that the sin that the scapegoat is carrying is separated. See. This is what happened. Jesus, when he was buried, you know, he was buried. You know, if you notice, the scripture always tells us that, you know, when Jesus was crucified, he died, he was buried, and before he was raised. The reason why he was buried is so that the sin of the world that he carried upon himself can be put away from us as far as the east is from the west. So when Barabbas was set free, it was you and I being set free. We were set free because when we come into Christ, like I said, we are set free from every sin, every bondage, every death, everything that militates against you, you're set free from it completely. Whilst Jesus, the Bible says, was whipped and handed over to be crucified. So Jesus became the sin offering. That was what Pascal Friday was all about. That is what Good Friday is all about. It was about him being crucified. It was a treacherous night. It was a night of betrayal. It was a night that was bloody. But all of that happened because he wanted to set you and I free. He wanted to set the sons of the father free. He wanted you and I to be free from every oppression, free from every sickness, the prophet Isaiah says he was wounded for our transgression, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. By whose stripes you are healed. Tonight, I want you to receive everything that God has in store for you, for which he had to send his son to the cross. There was an exchange that took place. Paul says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. Now, there was an exchange that took place when he suffered for you and I. 
And that exchange is what I want you to be a recipient of tonight. Wherever you are, I want you to buy your hearts. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, on this Paschal Friday, I pray, O oh God, even as I join my faith with that of your sons and your daughters, the sons of the Father, even as we study tonight, I pray, O oh God, that the anointing of your spirit we destroy every yoke that the blood that was shed on that cross on behalf of each and every one of us, that those who do not know you as Lord and Savior, that that blood is speaking better things for them right now, more than the blood of Abel. Father, I decree now that the blood of Jesus that speaks better things will begin to permeate every situation, every circumstance in the lives of your precious people, every sickness right now. Father, I pray that the anointing of your spirit will destroy the yoke of sickness, that health will be restored back to your body, soundness will be restored back into your life. Every lack right now, Father, I pray that you will provide, that you will meet your people at every point of need. Everyone who is bound or oppressed, oh God, that by the power and the anointing of your spirit that they will be set free right now. I thank you, oh God, for the ministry of the Holy Spirit that is taking place to everyone who is listening to the sound of my voice, that your life will not be the same again, that your life will be transformed. And even those who do not know the Lord Jesus Christ, even right now, I want you to say this prayer after me because you've got to accept him in order for you to be set free. The Bible says, he who the Son of Man has set free is free indeed. The Son of Man wants to set you free, but you've got to be in him. The Bible says that if any man be in Christ, is a new creation. If any man be in Christ, is a new creation. You've got to be in him in order for you to experience that freedom in order to be set free from your bondage, set free from oppression, set free from death, set free from separation with God. I want you to pray this prayer after me. Say after me, Heavenly Father, I come to you now in the name of Jesus. I heard the good news of your love for me and of your sacrifice. I received that sacrifice the precious blood that was shed on my behalf so that I can be free from the power of death and sin. I accept you, Lord Jesus, my Messiah, into my heart as my Lord and my Savior. And I thank you for accepting me. In Jesus' name, Amen. If you said that prayer, I want you to know that you have started a new journey with God and your life will never be the same again. I want to encourage you, even on this Pascal Friday, that as you have made that decision, all things are passed away. All things are new and all things are of God. And I want you to start this new journey with God, even on this auspicious day. I want you to get into a good Bible teaching church and begin to learn you know, the word of God and begin to walk with God and let him fulfill the purpose that he intended for your life. Now, if you want to be a part of our ministry, you know, you're going to find our details as you go on our website and even on our Facebook page, you know, the address of where we are located so that you can come and spend a time of worship with us. We look forward to having fellowship with you. And I want to say to every one of you who have listened to me tonight, I believe that God has spoken a definite word to you tonight, that you have been set free and you are going to walk in that freedom because he who the Son of Man has set free is free indeed. I want to encourage you, even as we celebrate this season, to continue to seek the face of the Lord. And I pray that he will continue to direct you towards the fulfillment of your purpose. Now, I want to encourage you also to continue to support this ministry with your love gifts and your offerings. And I pray that God will multiply those seeds back into your life a hundredfold and even much more. Thank you for joining me on this broadcast this evening. And I look forward to connecting with you again. Until then, 
God bless you. Much love. Thank you for listening in. We hope that this word has uplifted and empowered you and will cause you to become all that God has called you to be. Bethesda Christian Center, empowering kingdom people with kingdom word for kingdom living.